Welcome back, Hub Heroes. I'm super excited. Another episode of the Hub Hero Sidekick Strategies. That's right. I'm your boy, George B. Thomas, and today we're talking about Chat GPT. By the way, as a guy who has the initials GBT, do you know how hard it is for me to say the word Chat? GPT. I literally have to pause anyway. And coding HubSpot like a pro. The good news is it's not just me. I'm here with Connor Jeffers, the man, the myth, the legend. Connor, how the heck are you doing today? I'm good, man. Uh, I feel like you should launch Chat Chat GBT. It's a <laughs> yeah, great, it's a great one. You can bring all the personality. Yeah, I tried to get the domain, and I will not tell you how much they wanted to charge <laughs> for that domain. I was quickly like, oh, nah, I was going to buy good. this for an easy, like, here's my socials, or here's how yeah, you yeah, can yeah. talk to me. I'm not going to spend $65,000 for people it's actually to less to than I would have thought, to be honest with you. That's not, that's less than I would have thought. Yeah, it was a, well, it's less than what you thought, but it was a lot more than I thought, because... I was looking for the $9.99 for the first month or so. But anyway, Connor Jeffers is founder and CEO of Aptitude 8, an elite tiered HubSpot technical consulting firm, and happily, my boy Max Cohen, I just got to throw that out there, and App Studio Building and DAX products on top of the HubSpot platform. Prior to uh, A8, Connor led growth teams building venture backed companies on top of Salesforce. <sighs> Dirty word in this episode, but we'll take it. And operated a consulting firm on the Salesforce ecosystem. He has over a decade, ladies and gentlemen, of experience in system orchestration, digital transformation, revenue operations, and growth. Now, without further ado, let's get into the good stuff. Connor, we are talking about nerdy stuff today. And one of the things that I want to do is be able to just level set for some of the people who are tuning into this, either in the audio version or the video version, can you just take a couple minutes to explain what ChatGPT is and how it can be used as a coding assistant, along with how it may pertain in that manner to HubSpot? Well, you have to understand, George, I'm just a large language model. And so I can't answer that question. Uh, no, I can't. Uh, so so when we, when we talk about ChatGPT, uh, all the rage from OpenAI, uh, I feel like there's a bajillion content all over the place. Uh, but essentially, um, it's a tool that allows you to interface with some of the, the newest and largest and most robust uh, natural language models uh, via a chat interface. Uh, and most recently and most excitingly for, for me and my team has been uh, the new code interpreter, uh, and it can do all sorts of wild and crazy things. Um, but some people are talking a lot about AI and ChatGPT for uh, content and marketing stuff, and I think that that is... Uh, cool uh but the things that really get us super excited is some of the stuff that you can do with technology and development and code and i think from my perspective uh the primary value is really bringing down the barrier for people to be able to interface with things that previously you'd really have to understand how to write code build code understand apis do a lot of this kind of stuff and uh, make it a lot easier for people to be able to access and, and leverage which i think is sort of the democratizing force uh of all of the AI tools in general. I love this. I do want to go off the beaten path almost immediately because you said code interpreter. Uh, can you just dive a little bit deeper into that and what that is, like how we would be part of that or use it or like all of those kinds of pieces? Because I do agree with you. The major conversation is uh, chat GPT for AI assisted writing or research or marketing things let's let's dive into what that code uh what did you say again code interpreter code right interpreter is what yeah, they've called it let's uh, talk about i honestly that. haven't reflected on the term until you've said this and i'm like it is a weird it is a weird term uh essentially so so the code interpreter uh is a beta functionality that's available in gpt4 so if you are a paid uh chat gpt user which is 20 bucks a month which like i i think like dollar per value is like probably one of the, one of the highest, highest dollar per value bucks. you can do. It's yeah, like, like instantly one first thing. Hour, like, first hour, first hour, twenty bucks. Yeah. Oh, paid. Yeah, check it out. It's incredible. Uh, but the code interpreter is a new beta on GPT four. So the code interpreter does kind of two things um, with ChatGPT. Uh, the first one is that it lets it understand code. Uh, so if you give it code and and you ask for it to uh, edit that code, try to model that code, change the language, do something that's effect, it'll understand what that code is. Um, it will 
will also write code to solve problems, uh, which is honestly like really wild and <laughs> spooky to watch when you kind of like see it actually happen. Um, but you can ask it to do things. You can upload a file and then it will use code. Uh, it, it supports Python today. It'll basically use Python to do the things you ask it to do. Uh, and we can talk about what all of those things are but uh basically think about it as if it's a think about all of the magic that if you've ever used any of the chat gpt3 or 3.5 stuff uh and it's that and then also combine it with like a decent software engineer uh who really knows what they're doing and it's just like ridiculously fast uh and and you can start to get, start to get a picture of it yeah and i want to dive into that because i think you're headed in the direction that we need to unlock people's brain to and that is what are like some of the main benefits of using chat gpt for custom coding again it could just be custom coding or custom coding in hubspot compared to that traditional coding method that somebody might be used to yeah so i'll give you like a really we can we can start on the basics and then we can start to kind of like go up and I'll, I, there's kind of two different things that i'll talk about here and i'll do my absolute best to delineate between the two uh because they're very different one is uh interfacing with gbd4 and the code interpreter through chat gpt like through through the interface as a person working with it the second one is what you can start to do by developing and building on top and actually piping information into the GPT models, uh, more of like an API layer, uh, and then getting things back out. And then kind of the third is like, what does that look like into the future? Uh, but let, let's start at sort of like V1, which anyone can do. Like you do not need to know development. You do not need to know how to write code. Python might just be a snake to you. That's okay. Uh, you can use GPT-4 in the code interpreter. So I'll give you a very real example of something like I did this week and like honestly blew my mind, uh, which was I were working on fundraising for Happily. We're pulling out uh, our subscription data from HubSpot and we're trying to get like uh, reports and charting. And, and one of the things I'm trying to figure out is like, what gives the best looking revenue curve that I can slap onto an investment deck, right? And so I was like, do I want this monthly? Do I want this quarterly? Like, how do I want this to look? And as I was working on it with my designer, she was struggling with, hey, I'm trying to get this chart, but like it's showing MRR and I want to roll it up and I want to do ARR or whatever. So she's basically, I have this Excel sheet and I'm trying to do like V lookups and pivot tables and trying to get it to look a certain way. And so we spend like 20 minutes talking about this last week and on monday i had a meeting cancellation she's out sick i'm like i really need this done so i just i i downloaded the file i go to chat gpt and gpt4 in when you flip on the code interpreter there's a little plus button you can upload a file so you can upload like the csv and i just put in all of our our transaction information and i was like hey here's this what i want is a table and i want a table that shows me the rolling mrr for every month uh, and in like a second, it's like, okay, cool. Here's that table. And you can, it'll show like, here's all the code. There's like a little working section and then it'll, you can click it. It'll expand all the code it's writing. And what's wild when you watch this is it like self corrects its own assumption. So it like goes and runs on it and it says, Hey, I tried to do this, but it looks like the dates are actually all text and they're not all the same format. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to normalize those all to be the same date format right now. Uh, and then it just does it. And it's like, cool, I did that. Now I'm going to combine everything by months. And I didn't give it, here are all the steps we need to do to get this to the right place. Like it's, it's interpreting, what is it I want to achieve? What does it need to do in order to get from where it's at to that end destination? And let me compile all of that. Uh, so it gives me the table and then I'm like, cool, can you give that to me as a chart? And it gives me the chart. I said, cool, instead of looking at monthly, can you group all of that quarterly? And it updates the chart. And then I gave it the brand guidelines with the hex codes of the color palette for our deck. And I was like, can you format this chart in a way that is copy pasteable into my, into my slides? Uh, and then it spat that back out. Uh, and I honestly, like my experience where this was like, this is wild. Uh, <laughs> like, like this is something that I would have done with other people. I would have taken like at least several hours, if not a couple of days between Slack messages and everything else. Uh, and that's just like, and data level stuff, whether you're, here's all the data, what's the trend, um, in, a really solid HubSpot example that we used recently is like we have an open text field uh, on sign up for if you install any Happily app, we ask you, how did you hear about us? Uh, and what we were doing is taking all of those data points uh, and you can load them all up to ChatGPT and you can say, convert all of these into pick list values uh, and just p figure out what pick list makes sense between the most common things with everything in this data set and just like summarize all of it. And it'll convert all of that into here's a bunch of drop down values that we would suggest based off of 
everything you just uploaded in this file. Uh, and it's doing all of that by reading the Excel file and it can read PDFs. Uh, you can start getting into really crazy stuff. Um, but that's kind of the code interpreter is you can interface with it in those kinds of ways. Uh, and data is, I think, a really accessible way for people to be able to kind of come in and kind of have a rough understanding. Like if you like quite literally, if you were ever in a position and you're struggling with an Excel formula, just stop and like literally go to GPT-4, put in your file and just be like, I want this. And you'll just, it'll just give it to you. It'll blow your mind. I mean, I'm sitting here listening to the great examples that you gave and I'm like, oh my God, my my mind is blown. And I, I'll be honest with you and the people who are listening or watching this, I'm like, well, what does that mean if I wanted to like code a calculator or what does it mean if I wanted to create this widget or how, you know, how could I do this power my business in this other way in minutes or s like seconds? And the thing that really blew my mind is I was like, wait, wait, this thing is doing something that I couldn't do in high school. It's showing its work. Like what is happening right now? And it's, it's amazing to me. Now, here's the thing. And I don't know if I want to call this best practices yet or if I just want to call it Connor's brain. But I know my next question is when you went in there, you were thinking about it in a certain way. You knew you wanted to do it in a, a certain way. You wanted to talk to, you know, the, the AI in a certain way. So like marketers that are watching this, developers that are watching this or listening to it, um, and they're new to using AI powered coding assistance or, you know, what we're talking about today. What are some key considerations, uh, best practices? How do they unpack Connor's brain? Like, what should they keep in mind when integrating chat GPT into their workflow? Yeah. So I think, I think the biggest thing with GPT that people have to remember, uh, and, and I think, I think the word AI has like created bad assumptions with this. Um, all, all chat GPT really does is it's honestly, it's a guessing machine. Uh, that's all it does. It, it basically ingests all of the known information in the world. Uh, and you ask it a question, it reads your question and then it guesses like quite literally a character by character and word by word. Like what would a good answer to this question be? And most of the time, that's like a pretty good answer. Uh, but some of the time, it's not. Uh, and some of the time, it's wildly wrong. And I think one of the things that people, when they try to dunk on GPT, is they're like, oh, well, I asked this question, it gave me a wrong answer. And I'm like, it doesn't know anything. <laughs> like, like, it has no knowledge. Uh, Google is like, let me go and find all of the information and try to give you the most accurate one. ChatGPT just gives you the most likely one, which is why when you try, when there's like examples of people that come in and try to do it with like legal or medical, it'll just be like, oh, like these are legitimate sounding cases. Like this seems pretty likely. Here's some random case law I made up that like you should use because uh, it doesn't know what's right. And I think what's really, really interesting about uh, development and code and some of the things there is it's really not a subject to that concern. Uh, and so you can start doing really wild things, especially like I would, I would recommend enabling like the web browsing plugin and you can, what, some of the things that we've done is like going to a, uh, you can go to API docs and you can paste in the URL of API docs and you can say, what I want is I want a, uh, a piece of code that will create an order in NetSuite. And like, here's the link to the orders API for NetSuite. And what I want to do is I want to put in this company name field in HubSpot. I want to, and you could have multiple links. You'd be like, go read the HubSpot API docs, go read the NetSuite API docs. And what I want is something that will uh, create an order in NetSuite and it'll set the company name as the name of the company, but we'll look it up to make sure we aren't creating a duplicate. And like, here are all the things that I want. And in some cases, you might get something spat out that is like copy pastable into a coded action and works. Uh, and we've done that, like no editing, nothing like it, it, it works. We've done it. Uh, but more than likely you're going to get something that's like most of the way there. Uh, and it's going to be really useful. Um, another way that we've used it recently is our development teams. One of the hardest things about building stuff uh, custom, especially when you're writing code, is so much of how code works is like in the eye of the person who built it. Uh, and maybe they left you really good comments, but like they probably didn't, uh, especially if it's broken. And so it's really hard to be like, what does this thing do? Uh, and you can copy code. Like this is the thing where like stuff gets insane. You can do this with, you can do another really example. If you have like a, uh, a complex Excel sheet, like you can do this also, but if you take code, you drop it into GPT-4 and you're like, what does this do? Uh, it will tell you. It will be like, oh, 
this is a function. Here's what it's designed for. It powers a web app. Like here's probably how somebody interfaces with it. And it can understand what that code is. And you could even say, cool, can you edit that code? So like another, like here's this code, here's what it does. And what I want to do is in addition to the function it already does, I also want it to create an order in NetSuite. Can you give me a version of this code that does that? Uh, and it can iterate that and kick it back out. Um, and that type of workflow is already being integrated into uh, VS Code, which is a popular compiler. Uh, and that's actually just like, if you have developers, like go have them use VS Code and have the co-pilot on it. And it's that experience, but inside of where they actually write code. Uh, and it gives you insane superpowers. First of all, holy ish. That I'm just, gonna, I don't even know where to go. Like after that, like you had me at API documentation because I can't tell you how many times I've gone to look at API docs and as a somewhat uh, front facing HTML, CSS, a little jQuery, like development mind, I look at the API documents and I start freaking sweating. So like to be able to actually just, hey, here's a URL and do this. Uh, you had my mind was blown. Also, I too have met that developer that does not know how to <laughs> leave comments on their freaking code. We see you. Stop you it. You could ask it to comment the code. That's the other thing that's insane. Like, and it'll do it even now. Like, you can do it in VS Code. Like, it'll comment your code for you. Like, just, hey, what does this do? Can you add comments to this? And like, you should check them. But Anybody who's managed anything, right? Like revisions and edits and new cycles are way easier than V1. Uh, and and I would sort of, I think, I think GBD is amazing at both of those workflows today. Uh, I think that if you trust it to just do everything and give me something useful, you'll be constantly frustrated. But if you look at it as, and I, I think that people who are really effective at, at managing others, like just get insane superpowers because you can be like, hey, what I want is something. Here's kind of what it's like. Can you give me a version of that? And then you're like, ooh, this is good. Make these changes, do these things. Great, now I'm gonna take it out of here and I'm gonna go work with it myself and I'm gonna build something that I'm looking for. This is so good. By the way, I also did think about uh, probably three or four developers where I'm like, and I need to share this episode with these developers right now. Uh, speaking of which, I wanna talk about uh, what we might call collaboration or streamlining the processes of these businesses, agencies, people, developers, marketers. Um, and so in your mind, how does chat GPT enhance or streamline collaboration and communication between marketers and developers when working in custom coding projects, preferably with like their HubSpot and what they're trying to do or what they're trying to create as an organization? Yeah, I mean, I think what's really interesting is if you're not a very technical person, right? And I think that most people, like I, I think it's like the old product manager skill set is kind of like what everyone in tech skill set is at this point, which is like, I understand how you could build stuff, but I couldn't write the code for it. Uh, and then you have a lot of difficulty of like, how do you get like scoping? Like chat, it's amazing. Like you can come in and be like, okay, what we wanna do is we have this project and we're going to create these things in this way and we're gonna do these things in that way and we need to be able to parse this data and deduplicate it and we wanna put it over here. And you can give all this information to GPT, like in scratch notes, like go to a sales call, grab your sale, or like even better, take the transcription. Like, I'm not even joking. Like, go to GPT-4. Here's my whole transcription. Like, write a project brief that I could give to a developer that articulates, like, what we have to do here. And it'll just give you something that's, like, probably most of the way there uh, every single time. Um, and so we're using this a lot for scoping. We're using this a lot for project planning. Um, we're th another amazing use case if you do. Uh, t we actually have a project we're working on right now to make this a little bit easier uh, that I can talk about. But um one is like example data. Uh, like if you want tables and tables of sample data that you want to be able to just like upload to HubSpot, uh, just tell it like, hey, I'm making a HubSpot instance. I'm demoing movie theaters and I need like a bunch of theaters and I need show times and I need films and like what should the data model be? It'll just tell you what the data model should be. And then like give me tables that are example data for all of that. So a project we're working on right now uh, is a data model builder where you could tell it 
uh, what type of organization are you and what, and it would still suggest what objects you should use. Uh, but then you could also say, oh, I actually really need like a concessions object or whatever. And it'll say, great, that sounds good. Uh, and then it'll say, are there any important fields on any of those objects that like you really want to make sure are included? You could maybe tell it what fields and it'll just guess what fields you want. Um, and then it'll just spin up a developer portal that has all of those objects, all of those fields, all of those properties, and then all of the sample data uh, that's like pre-configured. Uh, and then you could just like go show it. Um, and I think the craziest thing about that, that statement, right. Uh, that's not like a crazy advanced, like you need to be like an AI developer. Like that's not complicated. Like it's, it's like a form and kick data to GPT-4 and then like use a put in the HubSpot API and like load it all up and that's it. Uh, and you can build things like that. And so I think that's where you can start taking that conceptually and sort of extending it to what does the AI powered CRM of the future look like? And it's, it, I think it gets, it gets really crazy really fast. Uh, somebody needs to call 911. I need help. My brain is melting <laughs> right now. Like I'm listening to you talk about this and I'm literally like, I have had an idea for a while as a guy who loves to do HubSpot tutorials and would love things to be populated with data so people see what a real world scenario would look like in a fake world. Um, OMG. Okay, let's continue on. I don't know, viewers, listeners, if your brain is freaking out. I hope it is because that means that you're on the precipice of change and doing something different. Here's the thing. If you are listening to this and you are ready to change and you want to start testing this, I want to make sure that we're, we're paying attention to something that is highly important. And so, Connor, what are some of the potential challenges or limitations that users may face when utilizing ChatGPT for coding uh, these custom codes, HubSpot coding, like, A, limitations, and are they just – Find, like, nope, it's a limitation. Or have you found that there's ways that they can overcome some of those limitations as well? Yeah. So as of this moment, right, like Code Interpreter has Python, JavaScript, and Ruby. So if you want to do stuff outside of those languages, uh, it won't do them. Like, it doesn't understand them. And, it, and it's like, <laughs> by the time that this gets released, like, that might not be accurate. Uh, it's like moving pretty fast. Uh, so right now, you sort of have limitations on, on coding and development. So there are some really cool AI projects people are doing. Like, if you're a marketer, I would take a look at, like, some of the stuff that people are doing with um, using AI to generate entire websites or, like, pasting a URL. There's some that you can grab the URL of a website and just, like, rebuild that whole site in your own, your own like, domain is pretty insane. Um, so there's, it's crazy, but there are some limitations there. Right. Uh, and so one is, is coding languages. The second one is we go back to that guessing machine. Right. And I think that that's like the most helpful way to think about what these AI models are is they're just really sophisticated guessing machines. And that means that it's going to be wrong sometimes. And you have to, you want to check it, you want to validate it, you want to test it. Like if you if you put something in there, you grab it, you paste it, you move on, you just think it's going to be right, like you're going to be let down every single time. Uh, and so know that like it's really good at giving you first drafts and it's really good at giving you edits. Uh, like we used it recently for like, we don't know why this isn't working. I can't tell you it's driving me insane. Copy, like debugging, copy all of that, paste it in. Why isn't this compiling? It'll be like, oh, like you have this function up here and it's recursive and it shouldn't do that. And you're like, cool, do you have a suggestion for how I can fix that? And they'll be like, yeah, this. And you're like, cool. And it runs and it works. And you're like, amazing, I'm gonna move on with my life. Uh, but I think that if you're doing anything with with technology, I think especially like RevOpsy hacker folks, uh, and if you're integrating stuff, automating stuff, anywhere that you're doing these kinds of things, um, take it, take like a, a beat and and go and, and try to interface a little bit with GPT and see what it gives you back. And sometimes you're impressed Sometimes you're disappointed. Uh, I tried to get it today to summarize. Like I ran a RevOps bootcamp with HubSpot Academy. I uploaded the PDF of the RevOps bootcamp and was like, can you write me a LinkedIn post about this whole thing? And it's like, I can't read this file. I don't know what this is. And it's so funny. Like you get so jaded with technology. So you're like, ah, oh, useless. <laughs> like, like that's like an outlandish thing to come in from. But I do know if I had the transcription and I had the recording, it could totally do it. <laughs> like, And so I, I think that Areas that are really accessible to anybody are anything with like data files, Excel sheets, like never make a pivot table, never do data analysis, never try to build charts, like total waste of your time. Like take any Excel file, 
put in a GPT-4 and just be like, I want this. And it will just give you that. Uh, and that's incredibly valuable. Uh, anything with uh, first drafts of code reading API docs, like, is this possible? Like, is there an endpoint? Like something we do a lot for um, one of our products at Happily is Zebra. It's a it's a Stripe HubSpot connection application. Uh, and And frustratingly for like every single deal, there's like, oh, but we want to do this one weird thing in Stripe. And like, it used to be like, oh, okay, like, let me write that down and let me send it to the engineering team and they'll go look at the Stripe API docs and they'll come back and then we'll like see if it's possible. And something we're doing a lot right now is like, hey, here's the Stripe API docs. Like, can I insert a custom item into a memo? Uh, and they'll be like, oh yeah, you can. Like, here's the request to do that. And I'm like, cool. Uh, can you give me, like, where do I validate that? And I do a double check, but that's like a couple of seconds. And I think that that type of workflow, whether you're doing sales engineering or solutioning or building stuff, um, incredibly accelerating. Yeah, it's so interesting. I, I, I've, I know the power on one side of this, and I hear now the power on this other side that we're talking about today. Um, because it's funny, you mentioned in seconds earlier today, Connor, I was talking to a potential client and they said to me, uh, content ideas are hard. And I had them rattle off. What are your services? Who are you providing them to? And a couple other things. And I was literally typing it into chat GPT as they were saying this. And then I asked it to spit me out 20 blog article ideas. And I started to read off the ideas to that person in the moment, in real and time. Like, and their face was genius. like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, you, you are a content god. Like, where do I sign? And it's just so funny because um, – and, and we're starting to hear this more and more. It's not AI that will replace your job. It's people who learn how to use AI that will, right? And, and so we're hearing that on the content side. I'm literally hearing that in my brain as I'm talking to you about this. What I want to do is I want to make sure that we give people some actionable steps here. So when you think about this conversation that we've had, all the things that are possible, the mindsets that marketers and developers should grab as they're moving forward, can you provide some actionable strategies or tactics that these marketers and developers can implement to leverage chat GPT effectively and efficiently in their coding process in their day to day, if you will, where does your mind go with that? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is uh, go pay 20 bucks. Uh, it'll be the best 20 bucks you ever spent on uh, upgrading to to the, the GPT-4 uh, engine. I think that that's probably a good step one. Um, I think step two is like play with it, try it, uh, see, see what you can get it to do for you. Like, honestly, we are so early. And like, I think even when you go... And I, and what I did, like, right, I started, I went to YouTube and I was like, what are some cool things that I can do with this right now? And like all the videos I saw, I was like, these are not very interesting. Uh, and then I think just start to troubleshoot and experiment and see what you can kick in there and see what you can get back out. And I, I would suggest for most things you do, if any, and I, there should, I'm sure that there's some, there's probably like some great word in German for this that I just don't know, but like whatever the moment is when you're trying to do a thing and you have like a very clear and articulate idea of what that thing is, but you don't know the steps in order to get to that next point. Stop what you're doing, go to GPT-4, and just be like, hey, <laughs> here's what I'm trying to do, and here's the output I want. And if you are working with a coded file, give it the coded file. If you're working with a with a data table, give it the data table. And you will you're like you will be amazed by what you get out the other side. And I think that the more you do that and the more exposure you get, the more you start to be like really like, oh cool, I understand how I can do this. I understand how this can tie into my my workflow and what I'm doing. And like crazy things that we've done. I mean, uh the the talk I'm giving in inbound this year I didn't give the title of. I gave all of the content to GPT. I gave it information about who I am and I asked it to fill out like 30 different submissions with all of the table information of the uh, the inbound talk template. And it gave it back to me and I was like, this looks great, give it to me in a table. And, at that, and I'm thinking about this right now. I haven't thought about this since I told this. Then I went and copied all of that and put it into an Excel sheet and like formatted it. And instead I could have just been like, hey, here's an Excel sheet. <laughs> like, can you fill that out for me and just give me the file? And now it could just give me the file. But I think anytime you have those moments where you're trying to figure out Oh, I'm stuck. Like, how can I do this? This is really frustrating. Or why, which, which items are in this sheet, but not this sheet or this table, any of those things where you're like, how do I do this? Like, let me go Google it. Let me look up a V lookup. Like that's a very tangible example for a non developer. Anybody who writes code 
whether it's for a living or like very much not for a living, uh, you have that experience all the time, which is like, how can I get this thing to do the thing I want it to do? And if you can articulate what is the thing you want to do, what does the outcome look like? It can usually help you get there uh, in really tangible ways. It's funny because when I hear you talk, Connor, I literally envision it's like your uh, personal assistant. It's your little buddy on your shoulder that when you get stuck, you'd be like, hey, what should I do here? And then like just thinking of it that way and embracing it. And uh, the other thing I heard in that section, by the way, it might be a rewind point of the interview is taking time to educate yourself. That's a great step of like, go watch some YouTube videos, go find a course, go like look at what you, and then play around with what you learn inside of the thing. It's so good. Now I'd be remiss if we did this interview and we didn't talk about the big boy and the big girl stuff, the real important things. And what I mean by that is, Connor, should people be aware of any privacy or security secu- uh, security concerns that, like, that the user should be aware of when it comes to Chat GPT for custom coding and being a personal assistant? Like, talk us through your brain on privacy, security, the sometimes boring stuff, but important stuff that we need to think about at our organizations. Yeah. Uh, so the, the first thing I'd say as an initial caveat is I would not describe myself as a, as an expert or evangelist for either of those topics. Um, what I will say is, uh, anything that you put into chat GPT, it knows now, uh, and it knows now everywhere for everybody. And that doesn't mean that, Hey, I uploaded this file and it had emails in it. And now chat GPT is just going to go and someone can say, Hey, what emails do you have? And it'll give it to them. But like they go into the repository uh, that is is the universe. And so if you have uh, any level of data security that you're aware of, either for your own organization or inside of those rules, like I would be hesitant uh, around some of those. Um, and I think that that's the big sort of one of the big pushes with um, Jarmesh's chat spot project, right? It's like, how can we give that power, but we can isolate the data set to like, it's secure and stored only in HubSpot and some of those other pieces. Still early days on that front. But I think that there are, uh, there is so much that um, you can do. Uh, if you are working with sensitive data, probably don't upload it to, to ChatGPT. It's probably like a good idea. Um, and I would sort of isolate it to things and, and, for myself with the exception of like customer data or PII or anything that we kind of like manage. Um, I'm not a super private guy. Uh, and so I like the robots knowing everything about me. I think it helps them serve me better. Uh, but if that's a concern for you, and I think especially if you're working with data that you have from other people, um, I'd be, I'd, I wouldn't be going and, and punching in credit card numbers or HIPAA data into chat GPT. I think that'd be a bad idea. Yeah. And the caveat is, if you're listening or watching this, seek legal (laughs) advice on those things for your organization, without a doubt. Um, I have a surprise question for you that wasn't in our outline, Connor, and that is, if you could boil this down to hashtag one thing, what is the one thing that you hope people take away from today's episode? I should go and play with ChatGPT's code interpreter. That'd be it. Simple. Easy, actionable. If people have questions for you, where do you want to point them? Uh, you know, where's all the places? Because uh, people listen, they're either going to want to buy you a steak dinner after this episode, or they're going to have you know questions about whatever. But where do you want to send them? Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, LinkedIn's probably my best channel. Uh, I'm super responsive. I post a lot of stuff. Uh, it's Connor Jeffers on LinkedIn, or you can take a look at Happily or something else. Uh, and we're around. We're happy to talk to you. Uh, and if you have questions or you're excited about AI stuff, reach out to me. Uh, I, I guess I'm very responsive. I don't think about it that way, but like I've had people see something, message me, and I'm like, oh, it's super cool, man. Like, how are you doing this? And they're like, whoa, I had no idea you'd respond. I am not. Like, I'm, I'll, I'll talk to you. I'm, <laughs> I'm very accessible, so I'd be happy to. I love that. As another guy who is very accessible and people say, wow, you're up at that time? Yes, I am. Hub Heroes, this has been a great, great episode. Uh, If you're listening to the audio, make sure you head over to Hub Heroes community, community community.hubheroes.com. We have the video version sitting there for you with show notes as well. 
Oh, until next time, I know your mind's probably blown. You need a minute. You might want to sit down. You might need a snack after this episode. But until next time, remember to be a happy, helpful, humble human. And we'll see you in the next episode. I don't know. The Hub Heroes Sidekick Strategies.